Okay, a subsection of the second part of the hero's journey is the road of trials. This is where the shit hits the fan. As though it hadn't already in my life, so, you know, but this is where another big period of my life uh, began. And I'm listing all of these names because these are all teachers of mine through this period to present the last 11 years. So I have really done a survey of various traditions. And notice Robert Monroe, William Buhlman, Tenzin Wang, Yon, Nam Kai Norbu, Robert Bruce are all, there's a lucid dreaming component in all of those teachers. And that seems to be a natural expression of mine. In your own personal use of the inner senses and altered states, you may channel, you may have clear audience where you hear things, you may talk to stones or trees or the sky or the sun, you may get this in different ways. There's a whole array of different things, but this is, this is my emphasis. So, beginning this intense period of study, no TV, off the grid, in Castaic, studying with Elias, I had my first stable projection form. Seth talks about three forms of the body, the astral body, each one get going further inward towards essence and all that is. But this was the first form, as I identified, and this is open to conversation too at some point, and I'd love to get from some of the experts and other experienced people's feedback. Uh, in a little bit, but I woke up in the vibrational state. This is the spine is like it's plugged into an electrical socket. There's a, a thousand volt current ripping through that. You wake up in sleep paralysis, but because I've been studying with these teachers, I knew not to be afraid. And the technique, I, I intuited this technique. It was a, a mantra technique simply going to sleep and repeating over and over, now I'm out of body, now I'm out of body, etc. over and over. It took about four days before I got any results, and I'd wake myself up. The night that this happened, well, the, the night preceding it, I woke up in the middle of the night, and I was repeating it. I woke up into presence of myself repeating the mantra, so it was taking in the subconscious mind. But I didn't quite break out of that. And then on the fourth night, I wake up in the vibrational state. And these are techniques that I had been studying also. But I want to describe the feeling. I'm there in the vibrational state, and there is a resistance to getting out. You have got to will yourself out when you're in this particular state. And Robert Monroe talks about this. He would roll out, when you read the Monroe books, he rolled out of bed. Well, this is when you're right at that point, you've got to out now, out now, and get out. And since I've been practicing that technique with Monroe for a year or so before that, when I was right there, I simply, this time, simply sat up, pierced that veil, sat on the bed, stood up, and looked back at my body. And it was way cool. And I knew not to concentrate on that because initially it can draw you right back in and end and the state. So I turned my attention and had this amazing adventure. And these three things at the bottom are just different techniques that I experimented with to stabilize the environment, clarity now, there's many other techniques. And another thing, I will remember all of this to remind myself so that when I wake up and write it down in my journal, I'll get it. Learning to address fear. Now, I mentioned that, how that can shut down these states, these altered states. Fear is definitely an obstacle. It's self-generated, and it's a counterpart of joy and bliss. So it's, it's a duality that's part of this framework one experience, and it's something that we have to learn to contend with. What I learned is that the, the core fear, the deepest fear, is a fear of death as annihilation. And that is simply the egoic self, the Paul self. Paul's job is to protect Paul, to make sure he gets enough food and sleep, gets to his job on time, talks to people, does what he needs to do. So he's very afraid of losing control of that and dying. And yet through all of this, you realize when you engage these altered states that you're not limited to the body. The body is an expression of your inner self. 
And this beautiful quote by Emily Dickinson is so appropriate. The only secret that people keep is immortality. And I just want to read a few quotes here from uh, different people on the subject of death. This is not a morbid addressing to the, the issue of death. This is a joyful addressing to the issue of death. This is by Willis Harmon, who was the president of, the, of IONS from a book um, in the mid-90s. One can imagine how much fear in our society would disappear if a new view of death were to become real in our lives. If we came to realize that we couldn't non-exist even if we wanted to. Just think of that shift of belief couldn't not exist, even if you wanted to. This is from Joseph Campbell, the mythologist, who looked at all the world's traditions and, and dealt with how they deal, dealt with death. And he said, you go to your death singing, celebrating. Death should be a celebration. Carl Jung, as a physician, I am convinced, and he's a transpersonal psychiatrist, by the way, a student of Freud, and Jane, it's in the set material. As a physician, I am convinced that it is hygienic to discover in death, in quotes again, a goal toward which one can strive, and that shrinking away from it is something unhealthy and abnormal, which robs the second half of life of its purpose. Another from Joe Campbell, one in full quest of the spirit knows that the goal of life is death. And now this is from Stephen Wright, the comedian, I intend to live forever. So far, so good. <laughs> and another one, Stephen Ray. What happens if you get scared half to death twice? <laughs> so isn't it ironic that the goal of our billion trillion dollar healthcare industry is to cure disease and aging and death? It's totally ass backwards from this perspective. It's completely backwards in this shift in consciousness that we're all part of is helping to change that slowly but surely. Okay, another step of deepening in my inner experiences during this period is encountering my guide. I decided, you know, I wanted to meet my teacher, a teacher, ask for a teacher. And I encountered a teacher in the back room of my childhood home, sitting on the sofa. He was a blonde Caucasian male, again, a very friendly eye image. They know these energies as they interact with you take a form that is friendly and comfortable for you when they want to communicate something important. It's a very uh, friendly visage. And I say, so what's, you know, what? And what does he say? First thing, let's reduce the number of aspects. What the hell does that mean? It was a, and at that time, I had no idea. Reducing the number of, okay, simplifying, making things easier, it was a paradox. But it was also a challenge. I'm going back in time now. I'm invoking simultaneous time, okay? Now we're in a place where I think we can feel into that. Because I didn't know what happened in this dream in 1985. I did not have a framework, even with my studies of the Seth material, to interpret it. But again, it was triggered by stress of the holidays, coming out of the holidays. I was in graduate school. I was finishing up. There was a lot of pressure in my dissertation. And my desire, I was frustrated. This was back in that period where I was in the real world again. And I knew I had these abilities. And as Seth is challenging us to develop our abilities, I wasn't developing them. So, so I asked my inner self to give me a dream and show me the way. So this dream happened in a library with Jane, a bunch of classes uh, with a bunch of students. And there was this whole bunch of activity going on there in the room. And it was sort of dealing with being a student of Jane. At one point, Jane comes behind me and puts her hands right over my eyes. And that triggers a change of state. And this is a picture from the Hubble, and I purposely put it in black and white because there was no color. And this is the closest thing I could come to it. And I'm going to read from my dream journal here. Uh, because I asked Elias about this, and the interpretation of this dream was very interesting. It 
in, in my memory of this, it lasted a short time. There was a glittering, moving stillness of darkness and light. And they're the only words I can use to describe it, but it has stayed with me. I'm wondering if you would comment on that. Is that regional area two, or what Seth calls framework two, is that a glimpse of the spacious present perception? Could you offer an interpretation? An interpretation? And Elias said, this is an offering to yourself of imagery, of not looking outside of yourself, but looking within to the vastness of consciousness and offering yourself a type of imagery different to your objective waking imagery and allowing you to view different elements of the action of consciousness, the sparklingness of it, the movement and the effortless of it, not being a thing, but being nothing. And I answer, and it was vast, it was huge, and he looks at me and goes, far beyond your comprehension. And that's why it was just a short perception on my part. Correct, he said. This is not necessarily a designation of a specific area of consciousness, but of consciousness itself. This is the ground of being. This is the, the pure essence of consciousness, the non-dual that all the non-dual traditions talk about. Another chapter connecting with future focuses. I had a dream and I asked Elias about this one too. About two weeks ago, a lucid dream, I saw a female with a crew cut hairstyle. Initially I was attracted to this female and approached her with amorous intention and realized it was inappropriate to continue any sort of romantic advance. I pulled back and realized that it was an aspect of myself. I knew it was an aspect. I remember the eyes and the compassion of this woman looking at me. She was just radiating, just smiling, staring at me. No verbal, just a feeling tone emanating to me. I believe it was a fo future focus of mine. And I'm also wondering if you would comment on the nature of that and why I lost the focus so quickly, why I couldn't stabilize it. Elias told me that I was correct, it is a future focus. But you find yourself in your excitement and your zeal to be connecting to this focus and your recognition of it, that you move into an area of intimacy which within your subjective awareness, you automatically know that this is not acceptable. There is an innate sense of violation even at the essence level. And why? Therefore, you fade within the focus, which this is a natural action, for to be becoming intimate with another focus is also altering and may not be beneficial to either you or the other focus. And this is just sort of a, a humorous part of the journey, too. Everyone you meet on these adventures is not an advanced being. These are not necessarily negative or evil energies, as I would describe them. But I met a female focus, and I asked her what time frame. This was when I was exploring simultaneous time. I was like, oh, you know, past, present, future. Can you get into this thing and, and, and teach me about this? She looks at me like I was crazy and said, I don't know. And besides, you're the philosopher anyway. And I'm like, what? And it wasn't until I woke up and thought about it, well, yeah, I guess I'm kind of becoming a philosopher with all, you know, anyone who studies this stuff and works with it definitely has, you know, deals with that. Oh, uh, this is another one, and I couldn't find the date in my dream journal. But I'm at my grandmother's house, and at some point, I realized the question, I want to meet my entity. I'm instantly greeted by 35, 40 people just walking by me. And I didn't know what that meant. And, and I changed state and lapsed back in the dream state. It was only after waking up that I made the connection that these were my focuses. These are my other lifetimes. My essence wasn't going to appear as some ball of light or some big confounding energy pattern to me. It, it at that time, knew what, what my stage of development was. And it presented just a little bit more than I could understand as a, as a as a quiz and keeping the dream journal and doing the journaling work, the, the reflection work, I had the, the aha moment, but only in my dream journal. So dream journaling is really, really important. Another dream I want to talk about is a near-death dream. I've never heard of these in any of the literature anywhere. We know about near-death experiences, and these are typically brought on by trauma, heart attacks, surgeries, accidents, and other things like that. But essentially, this was a dream where I came into a room with others, up into an office space, and this was a great honor to be invited into this office, and I was very excited. And I walked up in there with these others, and there was a door. 
and they all start walking through the door, and I come right up to the door, to the edge of it, but I stop. And then instantly the scene changes. I'm outside again, and there are all the others who crossed over. There's about 10 people walking down the hill, and they're all waving back at me, you know? And I realized in that moment, in the lucid state, because this was in 2006, that they had just crossed over. And I had been curious and come right to that edge. And had I just gone through the door, I would have left my body and gone on to the transition state. And so the amazing thing was that, is that dying is the easiest thing I'm ever going to do. And that doesn't mean I don't have fear of bodily harm or dying in, in, you know, slowly and in pain. These are regular Paul concerns that are still with me, and I honor those. But I know that the action of death is very, very simple. And then finally, dreams of Jane and Rob over the years. And I know uh, Sue Watkins asked for people their dreams of Jane. I didn't have time to send any of mine. But there was one, my miracles out of nowhere, and it was a waking dream. And I didn't know what it was at the time. I'm sitting practicing the piano uh, in my house, and this was in 1997. And I'm doing the uh, violin solo to a Kansas song called Miracles Out of Nowhere. And I'm just, and it's a, and it's a little riff. And I'm doing it over and over. And suddenly, I have this memory come in, and I'm still playing. I'm in an altered state of, of visiting Jane and Rob. And this green painting of Jane's up here, that feeling tone, it, there was a green carpet, green paint on the walls. She was wearing green, and so I thought, I'm remembering a dream that I had, and I'll look it up in my dream journals. I spent weeks looking at dozens of dreams. I never found it, and I realized only then, oh, this was a waking dream. Okay, what have I discovered so far? I, I, I create my own reality. The outer ego, Paul, my entity, and this primary pyramid gestalt. These are the three main aspects of myself that I have been exposed to through these experiences. Very quickly, because we're running out of time, I'm not even going to read that to you. Um, I'm going to pass that. The second thing. Reality creation includes mass co-creation. There's only one Seth book on that, and it's kind of underemphasized in the Sethian community. There's a lot of emphasis on the individual. There's not a lot of work, and this is a frontier, I believe, for the future. And there's a quote to spare you on all about that. The third element is that there's a moral dimension. Now, I'm not offering moral in the Jerry Falwell sense of the traditional biblical commandments, really in terms of Seth's postmodern sense of innate violation. There are no eternal punishments, but a responsibility for everything we choose, think, and do. Even if a violation occurred, natural guilt does not involve penance. It is meant as a precautionary measure, a reminder before an event, for the next time, to avoid it. So in summary, the core dimensions of reality creation include yourself, your world, and how we all get along. And now you can grab your music boxes. And if you just hold them in front of you, don't turn them yet. And we're just going to do a little experiment here to try and reinforce these three points of yourself, your world, and how we all get along. This music box represents yourself, a physical person, an outer ego, in framework one. And left-handed or right-handed. And now I'd like you. Let me just give the instructions. I haven't tried this yet, so I'm not sure how it's going to work. But basically, I'm going to have you all holding it up in front of you, turn the thing and make sound. And then when I say four, when I say the word four, I want you to, now I'm going to say table. 
I want you to place it on the table and continue turning it. So turn it. So let's start turning it. There's a right way and a wrong way to turn it. As I'm holding mine, I'm, I'm coming down. So if you're holding it this way, you're going up. Okay, if you're holding it this way, going down. Okay, I'm hearing a little tingle. And you kinda gotta get some energy into it now, okay? Let's see. Okay, it's very soft, right? So this is yourself in the world, isolated by itself. Right, you can barely hear anything, right? Let's put it on the table and try that. Oh my God, when we create together, when we do this, keep going, keep playing. Now lift it up again, off the table. When you're by yourself, who's on the table still? Surge. <laughs> I love you dearly, my friend. Okay, that's it. You can keep these. This is a takeaway. Please try not to bug the, the speakers that come afterwards. And uh, the third part of this, to imagine how we can all get along, is if we had it all queued up to the same tune, and I were to conduct you, one, two, three, four, and we do a little symphonic thing of this, Beethoven's Ninth comes out, and we live in harmony, and we all get along a little better. So with this in mind, Everything I've discussed this morning will not be in my new Seth book. But I shared it with you to help you understand my experiences that drove me to create this book. And that, that gird and, and support my love of the material. The title is the Seth, The Ultimate Guide. It's due out. Uh, discover your true self, your place in the world, and how we can live in harmony. The publisher is Hampton Rhodes, who's done conversations with God. Bob Friedman was here last year and heard me speak and asked me to write a set for Dummies book. I was charged with writing a set for Dummies book. I did not submit a set for Dummies book. But what I submitted was an attempt to introduce the material. There are 16 chapters in the book and three sections based on these three major themes of my own personal explorations. It's how I organize it. Our own Carol Funk gave it a, a pet, an editing pass through to other friends also, and Joanne edited every chapter and then did an entire going through of the book itself. So when we submitted the manuscript to the publisher, I just got it back last Monday, there were less than a dozen edits in the final manuscript of 250 pages. So we front loaded our work, we did it right, we handed in basically a finished manuscript then has passed muster so far. It's still not out of the woods in committee yet. And I, I don't have time, I have to finish up. I only have a couple minutes here. Uh, there was an experience I had several weeks ago after the book was submitted, after it was done. Again, it was triggered by stress of dealing with health issues, dealing with my stepfather's passing, and questioning the world and my own life, my own death. And this went on for six hours. And this was the first experience I've had based on meditation. I haven't had time to talk much about my meditation practice, but it's sitting, it's mindfulness meditation, sitting in silence. It prepares the mind for a more integrated spiritual experience and awareness. And it started in the physical realm, a lot of the eyes being closed and like waking dreaming and things going on. Joanne took notes for four or five hours uh, and even recorded some of it. And uh, at the peak, it, it went non-dual in that there was a light up here, there was waking dream here, and there was body here. These three aspects, this I, I, I was fully present and the sense of separation from this core ground of being was, was horrible. I, I realized that I'm here for a reason and I'm separated from my true self in fullness of my awareness. And the mantra that I got out of this, and it now sits on my monitor, is I have the power to fully participate in my life and my death as I create it. So I was really dealing with death again as I'm 54 years old and I'm in the second half of my life, attempting to joyfully participate in that coming thing. 
It's only now our first less reduced the number of aspects became clear after this experience. It's the simple feeling of being. I point out I, 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 different spiritual teachers point out different aspects of self, but it's all one. And so this was my inner self's way of giving me a challenge to understand, and only through altered states down the road did I come full circle, and this was just recently. My hero's journey continues, as does all of yours. I continue to follow the beat of a different drummer. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs>